Okay, we're set to go. Um, today we are going to, yesterday we, we wrapped up um, the periodic menu, we went through that, and that recording um, I have ready, I just haven't posted it out there, but it will be out there underneath um, the Fridays with Fiscal website. Today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, extracts, uh, some of the system options and utility options, and then we'll finish off with reports. So I want to finish off with reports last because that will probably take the longest. Um, so again, um, mute your phones and then anytime you guys have a question, please unmute and uh, we'll try to get those uh, answered for you. I also have my chat window open, so we should be good to go. Okay, so under um, extracts, we have uh, four different extracts out there currently available. We have the EMIS extract, which will be used at the end of the fiscal year. We have a GAP extract, which basically replaces the GAP EXP file from Classic. We have the online checkbook, which replaces the checkbook program in Classic, and we have a positive pay, which includes both the setup and the running of the positive pay. So it's the auto rec extract option, basically, um, in the redesign. So let's take a look at these one at a time here. Um, the EMIS extract is what is going to be used at, uh, the, like I said, at the end of the fiscal year. So yesterday, we went over in the periodic menu um, some of those programs like um, the building information. We went through all of the replacements for the USA EMS EDT, the, like cash rec, federal assistance detail summary. Um, so we went through all of those and we are going to be talking about those next Friday when we have the redesigned fiscal year in meeting. We'll go into those in detail and talk about those more often and the actual checklist to get through a fiscal year end. So uh, we will be covering those and this EMIS um, extract at that time as well. Um, but this is real simple. It's just basically the USA EMS replacement. And so it's going out there, you're selecting the fiscal year and then you're basically generating the extract file. It's gonna go out there and pull in all of those um, all that data related to what needs to be uploaded in the data collector. So it's going to be, you know, from, you know, your classic stuff, the USA EMS DB, the building information, and your USA EMS EDT steps, all of that. So all of these that fall basically under the periodic building profile, cash rec, civil proceedings, federal assistance detail summary, um, those are what's going to get pulled into this extract file. And then basically this file then is in the file format that's needed for ODE and can be uploaded into the data collector. So I'm not going to go into too much more detail about it because we will be covering this next week, but I just wanted to let you know that this is the file that will be set up and I believe, I believe there has to be, I'm trying to remember from last year, um, either in configuration or in modules, or we might have to set it up so that it needs to be an option. I don't see it in modules. Or I could just be dreaming this up in my head. Oh, no, there it is. Um, the EMIS soap service configuration. This option here um, is something that needs to be set um, for the fiscal year um, in order to pull that data for that fiscal year. So for fiscal year 19, we have to put in 2000 or 2019 in here and then um, and click on save and then it, it, it will then pull that information in. So again, we'll get through all of those details and how to do each step at the appropriate time um, when we cover the redesign fiscal year and next step. Um, I do hear some feedback, so I'm going to go ahead and just, um, if you could, if you guys could mute your phones, I would appreciate it. All right, sounds better. Thank you. Okay, so um, the next 
option underneath extracts is GAP. So this is the GAP EXP information. So in USAS, in Classic, you had USA EXP, you had the GAP EXP option. This is the replacement for that in the redesign. So again, you're selecting your fiscal year, and based off of that, it's going to go out there and pull all of that data to be loaded in to the GAP um, subsystem, into WebGAP. So in here then, you're going in, just entering in that date, it creates the file, and then that file can be uploaded in. So no different from, you know, basically what you were doing in Classic. The online checkbook, um, I have not documented this yet, um, and uh, so I haven't thoroughly looked at all of this to give you a very good um, detailed description about it, knowing what I know about checkbook and classic, um, you're basically going in and putting in um, a date range and then going in, and I guess we had an option there in classic too that you could exclude specific um, accounts, and it's going to go out there and pull the data for that time period and generate a file then that can be sent to the checkbook um, it, to the um, treasurer's office um, for, for the, for, uh, with all that checkbook information. Um, in Classic, we used to have an option that would send it to, um, the, to their office right from the program. We do not have that capability in here. This file would have to be saved and then would have to be emailed to their office um, from what I understand. Um, so that's one thing that uh, I need to document in order to provide that email information to you guys. Um, because I think the way that this is going to work, and, and again, I haven't researched this yet, um, with Classic, it goes through and sends it, and it goes through like a file transfer and transfers and loads it in via their file transfer program, and then it gets automatically uploaded into the statewide checkbook system. With this, I'm thinking that it creates the file. Pull. I'm going to pull the classic program here so we can see this together, so we can talk through it together. So in here, I'm kind of having you see these side by side here. Um, so in the classic program, again, you had the date range. And I don't know how often districts use this, if they do it like once a month or once every few months or just once a year. Um, but you would put in your date range, and they've got those same options in the redesign. And then there's that send data to OpenGov. So what OpenGov is, that's that FTP site then that goes out there. This gets automatically sent through that to be placed on the state treasurer's online checkbook system. So, and then there's also another option here that you can email this file to yourself, um, and it's got a line down there. Um, so what's going to happen then instead, and if I just go ahead and just run this here, just to see, obviously I want to say no here. <laughs> um, if I say no to this, then it's going to create a file for me. And it's going to, I was just checking to make sure that it's in CSV format. Um, so the same thing is it's going to be in a CSV format in the redesign as well. And I guess in here you can exclude specific funds. Um, and then when you generate it, a CSV file is created. But at this point, I don't know 100% if this gets automatically transferred. I'm assuming it doesn't because I would think you would have an option to say, do I want to send it on? to OpenGov or, you know, or do I just want to run this? So I believe, and once I get confirmation um, from the team, um, I believe then that those users are going to have to have an account in OpenGov to pull this file in so that it can be transmitted then 
to the treasurer's office, the state treasurer's office. So that is what I believe is going to happen with this. Once I get a little bit more information, I will document that. Um, but I know this is really new. We just released this here on this last release. Um, so I don't know how many districts are, are using this yet, but it will get out there and we will get this documented. Um, but I believe they're going to need a login to the OpenGov site in order to use this. And I know just talking to, knowing some of our Nawaka districts, we have one Nawaka district um, that they're both classic um, districts that are currently still in classic. I know one used to send it um, automatically. She used the Y option to have it send to OpenGov, but our other district, he had an OpenGov account already. And so he would just run the CSV file, look it over, and he went in, I, it must just have been a preference, he went into the OpenGov and uploaded it himself manually. So to, to each their own and how they wanted to do it in Classic, but in the redesign, I believe they're going to have to have that account in order to upload it in. So again, I, I'm 99% uh, sure on that, but I will confirm that once I get the documentation out there. But that basically this is the program for Checkbook. So one question was, can we, um, are there separate, multiple, can you uh, add more than one cash account? You should be able to, you should be able to do a comma to separate them if you want to exclude specific um, cash accounts. Those should be separated by a comma. That should be how that works. So in this field here, I should be able to put in something like uh, 200, comma, 200, or two to exclude those. So good question. And the last one here is positive pay. So the way we have this currently set up, because I believe they're going to be making some changes on down the line on this um, as to where it's located, because I believe payrolls, positive pay, and auto rec options are set up a little bit differently from USAS, and they want to make those more consistent, but obviously it's working now, so that's an enhancement that we'll take care of later on down the line. Um, but in here, um, this option allows you to set it up and run the extract all in one step. In USAS, in the auto rec option, you have to go in, and we covered this um, yesterday when we were talking about auto reconciling, you have to go into auto automatic reconciliation first to set up the file, set up, and then when you're in disbursements, there's the auto reconcile option that would pull that format in and then you would, you know, pull in the spreadsheet or the yeah, CSV file from the bank and auto reconcile your checks. This is the opposite. You're going in and you're sending, you're creating a file to send to the bank for positive pay. So in here, here's the setup part of it. And then here is actual part where you're actually running the extract. So in here, I have an example of like a fixed format file. Um, so basically, I'm going in and selecting what I want to go on this file. So you can see all the different options down here. So the spacer is, um, it'll, it'll provide a space in that um, format. So if I wanted purposely needed a space somewhere, maybe with the CSV file, and I wanted a space in between columns A and C, I could put in a space for column B, so it provides an actual space for that column. So in here, I've got this set up, and again, when I select one of these, I don't think I talked about this yesterday, um, when we were doing the setup for the auto reconcile option, it does pull in a default length and a default format. I believe that all of those can be overwritten based on your bank's format. So that's just what is given, but um, those can be changed. Now, we don't have any documentation on all the different format options, so that is something that's going to be forthcoming. Um, but so at this point, if you guys have any questions about the format, let us know and we'll get those, you know, figured out. But um, 
I haven't, to be honest with you, had any questions about the length and the format yet from anybody when it comes to um, the reconcile option or the uh, positive pay option here. So things seem to be working fine um, as they are using these default options. <coughs> so in here, um, so in here you go in and you just enter in your specific um, fields that you want included on here. So my bank account was the first one. But I've got the check number, check amount, check date, and the payee. Um, I know that somebody here said it would be a good to add an option to move the fields to a different order. I agree. I was trying to do that earlier. I'm like, oh, I really want to slide this one up here to this option, you know, have mine already set, and then just move them around. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice to have some type of arrows or just a way to hold down on that um, and move it. So again, that'll be something nice in the future. But again, this is a one-time setup, so it's not crucial at this time to, to make those changes, um, but it is something on down the line that would be good. So once you have your format set up here, you're not, you're not really saving it. Um, it's, it's saved when we exit out of the program. Now I know with the auto rec set up here, when we were in the automatic reconciliation, for different banks you had different formats um, that you could create and then save and then you can load them in and take a look at them and stuff. So you could have multiple formats um, for the reconcile. So I believe that is something that they plan on changing here with the positive pay in order to have the ability to save separate formats, but for now, you're going to have to go in and, you know, pull those in manually. So, so once those have been created, um, what you're going to do then is um, when you're ready to do an extract, the district's going to go in and put in the starting date, so pull the check information as of this date, and then they can also include the bank account as well. And what happens then is when they generate this, it creates the extract file. So um, depending on what you choose up here at the top, you've got CSV and you have fixed. Um, so it's just going to put it in that format in order then for the bank to, um, for you to send it, for the district to send it off to the bank and the bank then to upload it into their system. Um, so with, I had a question, in fact it was this morning, from somebody that was using the fixed format and they were just taking a look at it and they thought it looked kind of odd because it looked like it was running, you know, they had like, I don't know, 10 different lines, but the lines were all running on one line onto the next and wrapping. And they said, is that okay? That just looks kind of odd. And it is okay, it just depends on what you use to open up that file. So if I used Notepad, it looks like it's running. But when I use Notepad++ and I go in and look at it, they're stacked one on top of another for each line. And there is and I, there's a, an option there that I can search for like the line feeds or the, you know, for it to break on that line. And I was able to do that. So those things are there in the fixed format. So if, you know, if you're going out there and opening this up and you're just seeing everything wrapping, it's okay. Um, and when you file transfer it over, it's going to be all right because it's, it's got the format tied to that. So all that behind the scenes stuff that you really can't see, it's in there. Obviously the CSV file is going to be spreadsheet format. So you'll be able to see the different um, fields here in different columns. And that's really it with um, the extract. I'm trying to think, you know, if we've had many tickets come through about it. I don't believe that we've had that many. So, um, and I'm not sure, you know, how many of the redesign districts are actively using it, but it is out there and it is available for them. And so those are the four extracts that we have right now. So we got our EMIS one for fiscal year end. We have the gap for web gap. We've got the online checkbook and we have positive pay. Any other questions about those? I'm going to go ahead and move over to um, the system and uh, we're going to talk about um, some of these and 
I'm hoping here within, I don't know, one of these maybe Friday webinars and stuff on down the line here that uh, we'll be able to have uh, more of a technical um, webinar about some of the options underneath configuration modules and monitor. I am not an expert on any of that. I can get through stuff probably just like you guys are as well. Um, but I feel like we really need um, a more of a, a, a demonstration about the different options, especially in monitor because it is more technical in nature. Um, I can tell you what I look at in there, but it would mean a lot more coming from one of our programmers or one of, or, or one of our project managers to go through that stuff with you since they have obviously much more experience with that. So we'll get through what we can get through today and I can try to answer some questions and I can take good notes. So, um, but I um, just want to kind of give you a heads up on that before we get started. Um, underneath configuration, these are all the different um, options that we have right now underneath configuration. So some of these may already be activated based off of the import that this stuff's already been enabled and some of them need to be done um, in case you want to use that option. Um, so just to talk about some of this stuff, the pay for example, the payable module configuration, that already gets initialized. We need the payable grid. We need that information. So that will be initialized upon import. So it's not something that you have to go out there and set for your districts. It's already taken care of. A lot of these are. Um, ones that stick out in my head that you may um, want to do. Um, one thing is the authentic authentication and password requirements configuration. This is for password changes. Um, and I think we might have talked about this the first day. I can't remember. Um, but in here, you can go in and for a district if they want, um, changing the minimum length or the password expiration time, um, requiring numeric or mixed case in the passwords. So those things can be done uh, per district. Um, otherwise, the default settings is it has to be at least eight characters long and maybe require numeric. I think that might be um, the default. So obviously, when you're importing a district's data over, um, they're not going to be able to use the same passwords you know, those passwords aren't going to get carried over, is what I'm trying to say, into the redesign. Their usernames are, but you're going to have to create new passwords for them for the redesign. And so at that time when you're ready to do that, that might be if, you know, if that's something you want to talk about with the districts, if they want to change it or change the password lifetime, make it longer, whatever. I think it depends on audit as well. Um, those are things that can be done, but it isn't something that's mandatory. It does not have to be done. It's just that their passwords have to be created when they start in the redesign. Uh, Hi, Michelle. Yes. There's a, um, a little blurb in the documentation that says that um, if the, the passwords can come over, but they're already expired, you know, like, it will force them to add, uh, to change their password. Okay. I'm, yes, I thought that that's how that, 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 that's how that was working. Um, but I don't know anymore if that's, I might have to look that over again because when I set up like our passwords for the first wave, I did, and I think we talked about this maybe on the first day too, I did set them to expire on purpose, okay? So when I went in and created their passwords and I went into um, the users, let me pull one of them up here. What I did is when I um, went into their account, because their account was there, because that imported over, and again, they had the same 
type of access that they had in Classic, if they were a standard user, they still had standard access. If they had a filter tied to, to that, that filter was still there as well, so that got carried over as well. But I went down here underneath the password expiration and I put in, so let's say I'm setting them up today and they're going to log in tomorrow for the first time and, and I'm going to send them an email with their username and password. I put in the expiration date of today. And so what happened then is when they go to log in and I give them the username and password to log in, if because I set that password ex expiration to, to uh, expire today, if they try to use that, use that password I gave them and try to log in, it will tell them the password is expired. And it forces them to go to the login then and, and set a new pass, or I'm sorry, not the login, the change password and create a new password. So they put in the password I gave them and then they put in the new password and then enter verify the new password. That's the way I did it with our first district. But as you can see, if I don't put in an expiration date, it will allow them to use the password I gave them. They should go in and reset it because that's considered a temporary password and they should go in and reset it to something permanent that they, that they want to use, um, but it doesn't restrict them. So if I don't have that set underneath users to expire password, they can use that password. I need to set that in order to force them to go in with a new password. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, Thanks. great. That's a good question. Let me go back to configuration here. Um, one of the other ones, so like the disbursement configuration, again, these are things that are already initialized upon import. So, no, no, maybe not that one. Um, the uh, payables is, I forgot about this one. This disbursement one, I did that on purpose, by the way. No, I'm just joking. Um, on the disbursement one, this is where they can set up um, how many items on the check and stuff like that. So these are the default tier, uh, maximum items per disbursement, the number of lines per item, the stub lines, using overflow stubs and stuff like that. So to be honest with you, I haven't messed with these much, um, other unless the district would tell us something. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, that's just one option that if they want that information to change here, uh, maybe based on what they had in Classic, they could go in and make changes to this. Um, somebody had asked about the LDAP uh, regarding back to the user's accounts. Should we set the last field to zero? Um, let me go back. So I'm assuming you're talking about in the user account here. I don't know much about LDAP. I haven't really had any experience with that because we don't, our Nowaka districts aren't LDAP. Oh, I'm sorry, you're saying under password configuration. So you're saying where I was here, gotcha. I would imagine because with LDAP, that's for like everything. They're using the same password for all their different, all the different things that they log into, correct? Okay, so, and she said yes. So I'm assuming that the password lifetime would be zero. Um, I'm thinking as you're, you know, talking about that makes me think about other things as well, like, uh, if you're setting up accounts for third parties, like Strategic Solutions, um, Bonefish, things like that, I would assume that that password lifetime should be zero as well um, because we don't want to have to worry about those expiring every 90 days. So I would assume that LDAP would be the same way. Good question. Okay. EIS Classic Integration Configuration. So this is an important one for your districts that are using EIS. And for those of you that may have been on the touch base call this morning too, we were talking about that. 
um, as well. Um, and just one thing that I just want to keep in mind for everybody is uh, districts can migrate and still use EIS. It's not, they don't have to wait to migrate over um, if they're using EIS. All of our Nawaka districts use EIS. And so it really isn't that big of a problem for them because, yes, they're still using classic for inventory. All they're doing in redesign is first setting up this configuration and then going in and running an extract report to extract it out. And then we have a program in classic called EIS IMPR to import that the information into the pending file. It doesn't create items, it just pulls it into the uploads and into the pending file. And then from there, in classic EIS, they can create their tags. So it's, we really haven't had anyone complaining about it. They all think it's pretty seamless. Um, and I think for those that, you know, started on, that are in the redesign now, they're getting comfortable with the system now. So when EIS is available in the redesign, that's, you know, one more, one less thing they have to worry about unless, you know, instead of having to learn both EIS and USAS all at the same time. So it gives them time to get used to USAS. They're still going into classic, entering in their um, tags for EIS, and then once EIS is available, they'll be much more comfortable um, in, in, in the redesign and they can start using, you know, the redesign's inventory system. So, um, so with that, um, talking about this, in here, when they get imported in, um, want to make sure that this gets set up. So in here, they have a pending threshold and an automatic option. And if you hover over the automatic, it'll tell you what this means. So we'll automatically update the pending file for 600 object codes if it's checked, okay? So if it's checked, it's just going to look at those 600s. So that's kind of like, I believe, the A option in Classic. And if it's unchecked, it's going to be the 500 and 600 level object codes. So, and that's like the Y, the Yes option in, in Classic. Um, those flags were under USA Con. Um, there were two flags up in the upper right-hand corner on the, the second screen that had um, the pending flag and then the threshold amount. So you want to either preference of the district where they want to leave this checked or unchecked, and then the pending threshold amount. So whatever they used in classic for the threshold amount can be applied in here. So if it's like $250 or $500, that's their pending threshold. Now that's probably different from their capitalization threshold. So just keep that in mind. We're talking about the pending threshold here. So once this is set then, what happens then is when they're going in and invoicing, so they're going into AP invoice and doing their invoicing, it's, and they encounter an item that, in my example here, is a 600 object code that's over $500, it's gonna flag it for inventory. So they post that invoice, now they've got behind the scenes here these items that are marked, um, that are flagged for inventory. So what happens then is they go into um, the reports and there's um, an extract option that allow them then to extract um, those items out. So if I go underneath reports here, and I'll show you too where we have this um, documented. And I'm just going to search for inventory. <coughs> And so it's this one right here, inventory pending extract. Excuse me, I'm still fighting my cold here. And so when this pulls up, <clears throat> it'll give us the menu. And then from there, what we're going to put in is the beginning date range. Now, one thing that some of you may have been aware of with um, Wave 2 and Wave 1 districts is we did have a catch-up extract um, 
that we emailed to you guys. We did not in put it in, in, include it as an SSD, SSDT report in um, redesign because it was going to be a one-time report that those districts that had, um, for those ITCs that had districts on wave one and two, that they had to use because that flag before, I believe it was um, a release that we did in December to fix this, but before that, it wasn't flagging those items when they were invoicing them. So they had to run this catch-up report to pull all of those in, and that way they could take those, those, those then and import them into EIS. And then we also at the same time gave them this inventory pending extract then. So from that hot fix on, they would be running this, and that's what you guys will be running as well you know, for your third wave districts on, you're not going to be using that catch-up report. Um, then you guys, districts will be using this then to pull in their items for the pending file. So in here, you see right away that the format is CSV. That's the format it needs to be in, and it, for it to be uploaded into Classics EIS import uh, program. And then you'll see the since date. So this is something that they're going to have to remember. Um, when was the last time? So what I've told districts is get in the habit of doing this like monthly. And I know a lot of districts don't do their inventory monthly. Um, but maybe part of your month end processing, run this. Doesn't mean you have to go in and start tagging things, but at least run this um, extract and import it into EIS. So at least you're building your pending file in Classic. Um, so what happens then is, like I said, it creates a simple CSV file with the information that's needed. You know, the purchase order, invoice, account code, amount, all of that stuff will get pulled in. And at that point then, what happens is, um, in Classic, let me pull up my Classic screen again. They file transfer, save that file transfer it over uh, to their VMS side, and then they're going to use this program here to import that CSV file. So this import file I have listed here is the file that I created in redesign, and then I'm basically going in here and executing this, and then I would run a 501 report just to verify that everything got pulled in from that spreadsheet. On our home page here, this one, underneath our appendix, uh, we do have a procedure here, creating an inventory extract and importing into Classic EIS. So again, this is something that you would want your districts to reference because it tells them exactly what they need to do in the redesign, and then starting with step seven, what they need to do in Classic in order to get that information pulled into their pending file. Okay. Any questions about the inventory process at all? Go back to my configuration. talked about the EMIS SOAP service already, which is um, something that needs to be done um, in order to get uh, for the, when, the uh, when they go into the data collector. Um, so they need to put in what current year, so obviously they're going to be creating one for 2019, and then just clicking on save. So it knows then when the extract is created, it's marked with 2019 dates so that it can be uploaded into the data collector correctly. I believe if there isn't a date on here, it's going to be blank. And when you, you know, when you remember the USA EMS sequential file, the very beginning of that sequential file has the fiscal year. So that's what this is for, is to in, it, put that fiscal year in, in then, and then for it to get uploaded in the data collector okay. Encumbrance module is another one that will get, it should be um, initialized on import. So that should already be. 
So if these are things, if these are things you want to look at after you import, just to make sure that they all show initialized. I know that we've been having a lot of tickets on encumbrances right now, and I know we have um, one right now that I think there might be an issue with their encumbrance module not getting initialized for some reason. So this might be one thing to look at to see is this checked, um, and also to look at the import log and stuff like that, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but uh, these are things, again, that should by default in the import expenditure module, that should be initialized. Um, revenue module, that one as well. USPS configuration. And so with this, there really isn't anything that you would need to do to enter anything in here. This should be set up. There's going to be another option underneath module to install the USPS. That's where this menu comes from then. This will not be on here after import. You have to go in and install the module first for this to appear. And at the same time, it's going to build this information. I have never had to go in here and enter stuff. It will start talking um, once that module has been um, or activated and um, it'll then talk to, and obviously they're going to do the same thing on the payroll instance, install the USAS integration, and then they'll talk to one another. So you can see that the application ID, that's our side of things, is USAS with the API key, and then you see the remote application. So here's where it's talking to payroll and then the remote API key, and then all this other stuff that I have no idea what it's doing. So all I know is that stuff's there, so that's good. Um, but uh, that's where I'd like to get somebody with more technical background to explain all that to us. I don't know if we'd still understand it, but hey, it wouldn't hurt. Um, so like I said, maybe I'm down the line we'll, we'll be able to do something like that. But that's basically once you install that module, you should be able to go in here and see this information in here, as long as, as the payroll one's set up as well. The last one I want to talk about in here, that isn't one that's automatically set up um, by default, is the transaction configuration. And we've touched upon this um, the last couple days um, when we were going through the transaction processing and um, allowing it to uh, increment to the next number on file. So that's where we can put in their highest numbers here. So it's kind of like that little part of USA Con when we used to have all the, the tracking information on there. We, we uh, modeled that and put it in here. So one thing, in case you guys haven't been on the last two calls, one thing we talked about is how this works, because it does work a little differently than it did in Classic. In my example, I used with vendor numbers. Uh, because we've had a lot of questions with that, is, you know, they have vendor numbers from 1 to 1,000 that they were using, which were the regular vendor numbers in Classic, and then they had to use a 900,000 number for memo vendors. Well, what's happened then, all of that gets imported in, so when they go in to create a vendor then in the redesign, it's trying to use a 900,000 number. So let's say they had memo vendors 900,000 to 900,010 it's trying to use 900,011 as the next vendor number. And they're like, whoa, we don't want that. We want it to go back to our, our original range. Um, so what can be done is underneath, it's underneath the highest vendor number that you have a huge gap between 1,000 and 900,000. So what you want to put in here for the highest vendor number is you purposely want to put in 900,000 to say, yep, that's my highest number, and what the redesign does then is it says, I can't go any higher than that, so I want to look to see what would be the next number I would assign. It knows 1,000 was the last vendor used, so it will automatically increment to 1,001. So if you've got a big gap like that, make that, that gap there, that number, the beginning number of that gap, as your highest vendor number, and then it should increment fine from there. And that is documented. We do have that out there as an example underneath the transaction configuration menu. 
Okay, so those, like I said, I didn't touch upon all of these, but those are the ones that you're gonna kinda have to look at after you import um, your district. And we do have these documented. We have a post-import chapter um, out, or yeah, post-import chapter out there underneath the appendix that explains some of these things that you need to look at and make sure that they're set um, after you import their data. All right, while we're in this mode here, I'm going to go down to modules. And so these are the modules. Um, some of these um, will be installed already, and those are the ones that are in gray upon import. And then these others then are things that you can um, in install um, for them. And so uh, one of them I was talking about was the USPS integration module. So you need to make sure that that gets installed after the district's data has been imported. And then when we were looking at the um, configuration screen there, we saw that whole API information of how USAS and payroll is talking to one another. This needs to be installed first before you can see that. Um, classic requisition approval module. So if they're using, and I believe it's specific programs, um, then you can go in and, 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 and install this for classic requisition approval module, when that happens, you're gonna see those settings on the requisition with the different approval statuses. Um, the EIS classic configuration, um, this is the one that we already talked about. Uh, email notice uh, services, I don't really know all what's involved in that one. I'm just gonna kinda skip down to the ones that I know. Uh, mass change service. Um, this is, I kind of call this like data tree <laughs> in uh, the redesign. And I know payroll, they have, um, they, they've been using it more often than USAS has, but um, we haven't had an actual need. There have been a couple things that we've had, like the first wave districts do, um, using the mass change service. But it does basically what it says it does. It's gonna go out there and make mass change updates to stuff. And just like Data Tree, if you go in and do a major change of some sort, uh, it, there's no undo button. So it's, you know, there's no way to, you know, to undo what's happened. If you go in and erase all in Data Tree, yeah, there's no way to get that back. Um, so same thing with, with this. You have to be very careful when you go in here and use this. I don't have a lot of experience with this yet. That's another one I would like to do a special class um, or webinar just on this to get you guys more comfortable with it. So I'm probably gonna have to pull Jody in and, and maybe do a Friday webinar with us for us to get a bit more comfortable with this. Um, I know one thing that they had talked about today on the touch base call was the SetBell program. Classic had um, SetBell, which basically took your expended amounts and, or, and changed your expendable amounts to equal that. Um, and so we're looking into that. We don't have the capability of a SetBell in redesign right now, and we are, um, have sent an email to um, the auditor's office, to LGS, um, getting their thoughts on this. Um, so we're waiting to hear back from them, but if that's something that we will go ahead and, and uh, get done here, I believe it's going to be done through the mass change in order to make those expenditures and expendable amounts force them to match. Um, I don't know, you know what all is going to be involved in that, but I believe that's the utility that they're looking at in order to make something similar to what SetBell had. So. So if you have any districts asking about set ballot, that's something that we're currently looking into. Uh, I believe this Windows Active Directory is the LDAP um, stuff. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, LDAP Directory authentication. So those that are using LDAP, um, there is some information um, and installation for that. Other than that, if I go back to our documentation, I have to look to see what all has been updated um, 
in this chapter here. Not much um, at this point. So that's stuff that I still need to get from or have you know, one of the uh, programmers help me with this. So underneath modules here. Um, we have the, you know, we just talk about required and optional, but as you can see, we just have a handful of them documented. So the ones that I just talked about are covered in here. So not many of those, not many of these are updated. I know that payroll has quite a few documented already, and some of these um, are the same, mass change service and payroll and mass change service and USAS. It's just obviously you're mass changing different information. So you may want to reference that manual as well to see what they have documented for some of these. Um, but yeah, but obviously we, this is something we definitely need to work on. Um, is mass change added as access to a user or is it only admin? I would really, really like it to stay as admin. I would really like it to stay in the um, ITC's hands, but I, that's just my opinion. Um, there might be certain things that they can handle, and you know, that's the thing, we don't want to restrict them. If it's something where you know, they're comfortable with it, you're comfortable with it, that they can go in and make mass changes themselves, it might be a decision on your, that your ITC needs to make on what you want to do with that. Um, so I don't want to say no, you know, that the end user can't have access to this. Um, I guess it just depends on the situation. Um, so I really think it's up to the ITC to make that decision on whether they want this to be restricted to the ITC or allow the end user to have access to it. All right. Monitor. So in Monitor, there's a lot of stuff in here. A lot of it um, is um, over my head. Um, but there are a couple things that I want to point out um, that you sh should be looking at uh, when you're importing a district over. And the one thing is underneath the admin logs tab, this is the import log um, that is created when the imports run. So for the USAS one, if I just view this, it's gonna go in and show me what it was doing. So my current status says that it was completed. Well, that's a good thing, I wanna see that. And then from here, it's showing me what all it downloaded. So all these text files are your SWOT extract files. So when you, you know, obviously in classic, they're IDX files. And so you're using a SWOT extract command to extract the data out of classic um, and creating these text files. And then these text files are what is being imported into the redesign. So it's gonna go down there and um, show you what it's downloading and then what it's processing. And I, this is pretty clean. I, they've done a, a pretty good job of getting this um, cleaned up really nice here. And it, then it subcategorizes all these different processes and tells you if, there's our, if there are any errors. So um, organization, so that would be kind of like some of your USA Con stuff. Any errors, nothing there. The OPU. No errors on the OPU import. I do have some vendor errors. So that's why, you know, it's always, always recommended to do test imports before the district starts dual processing. That way you can catch some of this stuff like the vendors. Um, because, yeah, they have a ton of vendors and they may have some of the vendor zip codes not correct or the somehow Classic has, has Ohio spelled out instead of OH. So some of those vendors could be so old for many different versions of Classic um, that they need to be cleaned up or else they won't get imported in. Or if it's a vendor that they haven't used in forever that they don't have any transactions or any activity on, on the Classic files that could be you know, deleted um, before it gets imported in. 
Um, so this just kind of tells us what's going on with that import. Um, so it's, it's basically telling me that there are some errors um, on these particular lines of the import. So I could go to the vendor, which would be my vendor.txt file here, and look at those particular lines and see what is causing the issue. And usually it'll tell you over here, state field requires the two character code for US states. So it looks like it's not complete. It just has an O instead of OH. So just things like that. So I, I feel that these are somewhat easy to, to read. So obviously if you have any questions with those, you can create a ticket to us and we can help you with that. Um, so it goes through all the others. And then it gives a little summary output there at the end of everything that was up here, all of this processing, and it's pulling it down here with, um, I believe, amounts or the data that was imported in. So, and I believe on this next release, they're even making more improvements on this, if I can remember what one of our programmers said. Um, but this is kind of where you start. You know, if you go in and you start running balancing reports and the numbers aren't coming out to classic figures, then you may want to come in here and say, okay, is there a problem with what was imported in? So this is one place I would look. So you start with that. Um, another one here. Hey, Michelle. Yes. Um, the open requisitions, if they don't need them or want them, is it okay not to uh, to just allow them to error out? I think we've got that documented, Deb. Let me look. So I think we've told you guys when it comes to the requisitions. Let me look here. Let me go to the appendix chapter. Reviewing outstanding recs. So this is in the pre-data. If you have outstanding requisitions from prior years that they do not intend on converting to POs, they can delete those unnecessary recs before you extract. That way they're not getting pulled in. So that's something definitely that uh, could be cleaned up beforehand. But Michelle, Melissa, yeah. I think that the question is, um, is it necessary to go through that cleanup process on these older open requisitions, or can we just let them fail out? Um, will, that, uh, will that affect anything? Because I'd imagine um, a requisitioned amount is going to be kept on a budget um, record, and will, will there kind of be a disconnect between that dollar amount on that field if, if that's being brought in versus uh, if the rec was not? Right, because if they're tracking those requisitioned amounts, then yeah, then it's um, yeah, then it's going to you are correct. It's going to be they're not going to match up because it those amounts are still getting included on the account. Yeah, does that answer your question? Well, the district doesn't do pre encumbrances. We have quite a long list of open requisitions that were never converted, and we were just going to not do anything, just let them fatal out. But the problem is, though, are they going to fatal out? I mean, if you've got they those, don't. They, those, you've got those open reps. Say that? I'm sorry. Carrie, was that you? Yeah, we have old ones in test imports that have imported, so I do not think they fatal out. I don't think so either. I don't think they're going to fatal out, Deb, because it's still requisition data, and that is in the um, SWOT extract file. 
So those are going to get imported in. So that's why we, we have this listed in here, that if you have those that, you know, you don't plan on converting to purchase orders that have been sitting out there for years, then um, these should be deleted so that they don't get included in, especially since you aren't tracking requisitioned amounts, that you can go in and get rid of those. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Oh. Um, another tab that I will look at, um, especially if when um, we get tickets from people saying like they are, that um, something like their encumbrance amount does, hadn't even shown up, it's all zeros, and so um, they're wondering why, you know, did those not get initialized? I look first to see if the encumbrance module was initialized, and usually I can go in here as well into the status tab and kind of take a look here to see um, if certain things were completed. And so one of them would be this encumbrance ledger. So does that show a completed status or does that still say, does it say stopped or something like that? If it says something like stopped, to me that's not a good indication that the encumbrance module got initialized. So these are certain things that I will look at if I need to because of another problem. I'll go in here to say, okay, how does everything look? Um, and so I'm just looking at these particular jobs here to see what, what uh, took place and making sure that everything got, everything is completed. Okay. Well, what is that Ohio model um, one that is stopped there? This one up, up here? Right there. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that's for because it says importing since, importing until. It's all the same, isn't it? Model state running, model state starting, model state starting, model state stops. And I'm looking down here if there's any more model states and I don't see anything. I don't know offhand what that is. Um, and I don't know if it's something that needs to be um, that you know you need to be concerned with. So, but I could check that out and see um, what that means exactly and get back with you on that one. But I don't know offhand what that is. I would have to ask one of the programmers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there are a lot of different buttons out here and I don't know what all of these different things mean. So like I said, we really want to be able to provide more information about these. Um, what's going to benefit you guys obviously and just to help you with your imports and things like that. So I'm hoping here maybe this, um, these next uh, couple of few months here after fiscal year end dies down here, we can get something. Um, a webinar set up so that we can talk more about these more technical options underneath system. So let's go to something that I do know more about, um, <laughs> custom fields. And this is something too, we talked about this the first day, that um, may not be something that districts really are concerned about um, when they first start up on redesign, they're just trying to get a handle on getting comfortable with the system, but it is something just worth mentioning to them is that they do have the ability to create custom fields and use those in reports and queries. So, you know, they're so used to the mindset that this is what I had in classic and that's what I have to work with. It's not the case in the redesign. So if they want to create a specific field to track something, they can go in and create that field, and that's what the custom field definition does. So all of those um, user-defined fields that used to be in Classic are pulled into here as custom fields. So you'll see that right away when you're in here. Um, I look at the applies to column right away. These are all of my different custom fields that I had. So for example, cash account. These are all, remember we had code one, code two, um, date, text, 
those were our user defined fields, those all got carried over as custom fields and so we had them in the cash account, we had them in expenditure revenue and so you just go down here to all the different um, program options, disbursement, um, purchase orders, receipts, requisitions, so vendors. So these are all the different custom fields that were created. So some of these custom fields, if they're cluttering up the screen, so if I go into the cash account and I don't want to see um, a lot of these custom fields, you can disable them and they will no longer appear on the screen. So that is a district-wide setting. So, you know, once this is disabled, then anyone who logs into that um, specific program won't see that custom field anymore. Another thing that they could do is they want to use that custom field, but they don't like the name of it, change it. So they can go in and I'm going to go ahead and just edit this code one here. And I can make it something more meaningful. So I can go in and display um, and say this is, I don't know, cash. <laughs> and, uh, and then from there, the property code, I can give it the same name as the display name. Um, this, I believe, the property code is what's going to show oh, underneath more. I'm not 100% on that. We'll, try, we'll test it out and see. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and we'll just start from scratch and create one, but you can see that I can change the name on one as well. And it, it, so I'm using that custom field, it's just going to be under another name. Um, I'm going to pick on vendors. And in vendors, if I want to create, um, I always use the example of uh, the W-9 form. And I could use a lot of different ways here to create um, a custom field for W-9. I could make it a checkbox. I could put in a date so that I put in an actual date of when I receive this, the uh, W-9. I could also include another custom field of when I sent out the W-9 form. So lots of different ways that you can add these. So when I click on Create, Um, underneath here, the type, this is my format. What do I want the custom field to be? Do I want it to be a date? Do I want it to be a checkbox? Um, lots of different things here. If I just pick on Boolean, that's my checkbox. I did that one on purpose because a lot of people aren't sure what that's going what that's going to do. And then it's asking me when to apply to records. So what record do I want to apply that to? And so I'm talking about vendors. So I'm going to go down to my vendor record, or I could just start typing in vendor. It might be easier. And that's the vendor, that's the record I wanted to apply to. So when I go in to create a vendor, I want this custom field to appear in my vendor record. And then I click on continue, and then I get another screen here. What's the name of this? And I say W9. on file. And then the order, where on the screen do I want this to appear? Well, the first thing before I enter in an order number, I want to think about the section that where I want to place this. So if I go over to vendors quick just to look at the different sections, like you kind of have to know first before you actually go in and start creating one of these. And I'm just going to view this first one here. So I have a 1099 section. So that's something I got to think about. And it's called 1099. And then where on here do I want that W9 on file to show? At the beginning, at the end, that's where that order number comes into play. So I know it's a 1099 section and I can just at the end, that really doesn't matter to me. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel back out of here and go back to my, go back to this. So the order number, I'm going to leave that go and it's just going to go to the end of that line of whatever section. That's my group, 1099. 
So my section area of the 1099 I put in the group. What do I want the property name to be? I'm just going to call it W9. We'll show you what, that, what happens with that. Um, everything else looks good. I'm going to go ahead and save this. So when I go then into vendors, oh, I'm sorry, I'm already there. And I go and edit one of these or create a new one. I should see underneath the 1099 section the W-9 on file option. And, it's, and so if there is a W-9 on file for this vendor, I can check mark this to say that we have it. Um, so that's one way to create a custom field. Now that W-9 property it was talking about, I believe that underneath more, if I want the W-9 to be part of this, I'm going to go underneath and I think it's going to be standard custom fields, and I'm going to have <coughs> a W-9 option. Let me take a look. Maybe it's under the 1099 section. There it is. So that W-9 must be a property field like an, when I actually pull it into a report. That name I gave it is what stored underneath the more option so I can check mark this and include this field on my grid and so the one that I check mark here show, says that it's true. So if there's a specific custom field they want created because they purposely want to track something and they even want to track it so it shows on their grid, that's what we just did. We created that custom field, it's marked in here. And I believe if I go to I go to report manager here, curiosity has got the best of me here, and I go and click, I'm sorry, I meant to click custom report creator. And I go to the vendor object. And I go to W9. This is the actual property that I can pull on to reports. So the W99 file is the name of the field, but the actual property name for this is called W9. I would recommend using the same as your, your display name and your property name. That way there's no confusion. Um, but I wanted to purposely do them separately just so you can see the difference here. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, but yes, that's basically how you create a custom field. All right. DBA, I'm not going to go over because that's nothing that we need to be concerned about at this point. Um, modules, monitor, we covered. Remap is not in place right now, so I'm not even going to talk about that. Um, and I believe that districts, if they have standard access, they may not even see that option at this point. I do want to cover roles and rules. Um, so <clears throat> the roles that we have out there right now, these are um, anything with an, an underscore, with an underline, is the SSDT role. So system underscore user, the USAS manager, the USAS rec, read only, and the standard. Those are all ones that um, are defined by the SSDT, and they aren't ones that you can go in and change. Okay, so they won't have the ability, or us even with admin access, to go in and change um, the properties that are tied to that role. So obviously they can go in and create whatever role that they, or that you or they, again, that's a preference of the ITC, and if they want you know, certain users to be able to create roles, or if that, is something that is defined at the ITC. Um, so it's something that each ITC needs to discuss on what they're going to do with that. Um, so in here, oh, I missed one too. EMIS SIF role is another role that um, is going to be created with, uh, in order for um, the, the data collector and all that stuff to work. Um, so with that being said, I want to kind of go into a couple of these so that you can see the properties that are in some of these 
um, SSDT roles. I'm going to pick on um, the standard one here. I'm going to click on View. And like I said, you can't go in and make changes to these because these are the state software one. Um, but you'll see here there are a lot of different permissions. This is the information that's down here. And the permissions that are available are on the left-hand side. And then to grant a permission, you would select it and click over to the right-hand side and grant that permission. So in our documentation, I started and made a real hard attempt here. I'm getting a lot of these in so that you guys know what they mean. Um, and so if I go to roles, and I still have several that I need to address with the programming staff as to what these specific permissions mean. But if I go down to system and I go down to roles, Um, first, what we do is um, we specify, you know, what the SSDT roles are, and then we have the SSDT role permissions. So these are the permissions that are listed underneath each of the SSDT roles. And then we also have available USAS R permissions. Why oh, that jumped for me here? And when I click on that link it takes me down to the different, all the different uh, permissions and the descriptions of those or the definitions of those. So this is something that's still a work in progress, but this is what we have so far down here. Um, I still need to fill in a lot for the admin permissions, but down here when you get down to module and especially all the USAS ones, we have quite a bit of this, um, okay, I lied. Um, some of this filled in with the uh, definition or description of what that permission does. So, you know, we are, you know, adding more and more of these, but um, you'll see here what these do. And most of these, like if I pick the, I'm going to pick on, let's see, I'm going to pick on the purchase order one here. That one makes a little more sense. Okay. And so what you'll see here is it's got USAS purchase order, and then underneath that it's got USAS purchase order, and it has these different permissions with it. So when I am assigning something, I, if I want them to have full access to everything related to purchase orders, I want them to be able to create one, I want them to be able to modify one, um, things like that, I would go, I could go down to the USAS purchase order role. Um, and I could take that purchase order role and uh, just assign that, and that's what the standard permission gives them. You'll notice that USAS underscore purchase order is no longer over here. So basically this one line means all of these. So I don't have to pull all of those over. This is kind of like the parent, and these are all of the children. So. By giving them USAS underscore purchase order, they're able to create, delete, report, update, view. And so same thing like with receipts. Um, I know we've had a question about somebody wanting to give a user just receipt type of access. And so what you can do is I would create the role. And with outside of state software roles, you can name it whatever you want. So receipt user, you can't use an underscore. Um, that's one thing. If I try to do receipt underscore user, it won't let me because those are only reserved for state software roles. And then the description, receipt processing only. And then from there, I would assign the specific permissions for that role. And obviously, this is very new to all of you. So if you're not sure about something, you either test it by going in and adding those permissions or you create a ticket to us 
and we can help you with this. Uh, because to be honest with you, a lot of times I'm playing with them too to make sure I know exactly which ones they are and what they will do. Um, so in here, the first thing is I'm giving them login in order for them to even be able to log into the application. And then from there, I'm going in to say, okay, there's no admin type of access that this person needs. So I'm totally skipping that. Any modules that they need to have access to, um, no, I don't need that either. I'm basically going down to anything that starts with the word USAS. And obviously they're a receipt user, so I'm not going to give them USAS um, permission because that will entail everything underneath. I just want receipt type of processing. And so I'm basically going down and looking, okay, receipts, um, if I just want them to have access to revenue type of accounts with receipts, I can go down to USAS account, and I'm going down to revenue, and I can say I want them to be able to view them and maybe run reports on revenue accounts, and that's it. I don't want them to be able to create a revenue account. They're going to be using those revenue accounts when they post receipts. Um, if I also wanted them to have um, the ability to look at you know, budget accounts, because maybe they're doing uh, reduction of expenditures as well, I could also do the same thing with the expenditure and add that information. And then I got to think about, okay, that gives them access to account information. But now I've got to give them access to going into the receipt program. So I'm going down here again and going through here until I get to receipts. And I'm waiting for somebody to ask me, is there a way we can just query? <laughs> and just to, be, to find a certain permission? Yeah, we've had that question before. Um, and so we will do something like that um, eventually, but for now, um, you could probably do a control F and do a search maybe. I'm trying to think. If I do that and put in, yeah, there we go. It's not just going to search on that window, but it's going to search other places as well. I don't know if this will work. I'm just giving her a shot. So it doesn't work very well, but hey, it's worth it. Worth trying. Um, but you're going to see a USAS underscore receipt. So this is, there. Are, um, ability to, to access that program. What do I want them to do in receipts? Do I want them to be able to create and delete? Okay, let's say they went in and created the uh, receipt. Um, do I want them to have the ability to delete it as well? Eh, I'm going to skip that one. I want them to be able to do run reports, receipt type of reports. I want them to be able to go in and edit so if they go in and create the receipt and then they realize that the amount was incorrect and they want to go in and go in and, and go right back in there and change it, give them the ability to do that. Um, view. And that's about it. That's what I'm going wrong, to... Wrong view. You picked the wrong view there. You picked purchase order instead of receipt oh, view. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't looking when I clicked on that. Thank you. All right, so receipt view, here we go. All right, and also if I wanted them to have access to maybe to do refunds as well, I could give them access to that as well. And so I've got account view for revenue um, to run reports and view, and I also have these specific receipt type of um, access. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And so I created this receipt role, and I called it receipt user. And so now I'm going to go into my users. And I'm going to select, I have a test account out here already. And I'm going to change the access here to just receipt user. And uh, let's see, that's all I'm going to do. I don't know what kind of access I have, so oops, I'm just going 
going to leave that open to no filters and click on Save. And I think I still remember the password to this account, so I'm going to log in as test. And we're going to see what we get. I'm not making any promises. So. Okay. And so underneath core, because I said I wanted to view revenue accounts, when I click on accounts, let's see what we get. And you notice that I just said um, accounts, and, it, and when I clicked on it, it just has the revenue. So that's a good thing because that's all I selected. And then it shows me because I don't have a filter. If I had a filter on top of this, they'd only see the account revenue accounts that they have access to. So if this is like a, a high school, um, someone that's just going to be inputting receipts for the high school, you could filter it by that OPU. Um, and those are the only revenue accounts that they're going to see. So under core, that's all that I have access to. Under transactions, I told them I just wanted receipts. So I'm going to click on here. And I should be able to see the receipt menu. And I have the ability to create receipts, to view, and to edit, just like I specified in my permissions. Transact, um, I'm sorry, reports. Um, I noticed that some reports came up um, because of the access that I gave to revenue accounts and receipts. Um, so when I click on the report manager, these are the reports that it immediately um, gives me access to based on those permissions that I selected. So we got receipt ledger, receipt listing, so that's specific to receipt transactions. We have a revenue expense and revenue summary, which is specific to revenue accounts. So that's why we have all four of those reports. And I believe under utilities, we probably don't have much. We have job scheduler, which I don't know how much in proration utility. I'm not quite sure why those two are out there giving the access that we gave them. Um, they should always have the access to um, change their password. I think that's um, kind of a standard thing. And with the login and then the show profile. Um, just to show you show profile, it's just showing them who the person is and what roles were assigned to them. So you can see by the permissions I gave them, they have very restrictive access to the system. So it, it's possible, you, you know, these type of accounts can be created for specific individuals in the district. So before, and I think districts just have to get used to that, um, wrap their mind around that because they were really never giving those, given those options much before. We could, you know, in classic create a private menu, I believe, and allow them to have access, but that was convoluted and crazy as well to try to get that set up for people where this is so much more intuitive. Um, being able to go in and create these specific roles for specific users. So, any questions on uh, the uh, permissions or roles? So, it's just something to think about, um, you know, that eventually, once your districts feel comfortable on the redesign, th these are things that you can show them to say, hey, you can do this if you want to. Um, you can, if you've got a, you know, a temporary coming in to help with something, you, know, you don't have to give them full use as access. You could just give them specific um, permissions. And that's the only areas of the software that they have access to. Okay. I'm going to go back and log out of here and back into my admin account. And the other thing I want to talk about underneath uh, system is rules. And I did update um, the documentation to give more information about the different types of rules, um, bundled, mandatory, 
and uh, what they mean. And so if I go back underneath system here and click on rules, Um, I have sections on, you know, obviously we have all these things of how to create one and all of that. But the mandatory rules, um, I have a listing of all the different mandatory rules that are out there. So these rules come with the software bundled and are mandatory in order to use the software. So they're going to get automatically enabled when the data gets imported in. So these mandatory rules cannot be disabled. And then down below that, we have bundled rules that are not mandatory. So these are rules that we provide, but they don't have to be used. And so it talks about all of those different ones. And then down at the bottom, and I think I may have talked about this the first day, we have um, different rules that we have created so far. So when we get a ticket from somebody asking, how can, can you help me create this rule? We'll go ahead and create it, and then I try to document those as soon as they come out so that I don't forget about them and we can get them out there for you guys. Um, so we're trying to share these different rules so that you guys have the capability to basically copy and paste this then into a rule for your district. So like I said, um, all we have out here right now are mainly requisition ones. And we've had a couple of people saying, you know, this district doesn't want them to create a requisition if the account code is blank. How can we restrict that? So we wrote a rule for that. Same thing, uh, the vendor isn't on there. They need to have a vendor um, but in order for them to post this requisition. So we wrote these rules here that will allow them to do that. So um, up here at the top here, like, um, let me, Here's the one with the vendor. Require a vendor when creating a requisition. So um, the name of it is going to be specific to that um, specific district. And then the description is just a description. Prevent posting recs without a vendor. And then down here, the, the package information, again, is the district specific information. And then we have these import um, area here and then down here is the actual rule that is being written. And it's going through the code and putting in the correct information. And so basically, you're going in and creating this rule, copying and pasting this stuff and putting it in. And then you're testing it. Don't forget about testing it once you import it in or once you create a rule for it. Um, let me see if I've got one of these here. Go into my rules. Um, so, let me see, I think I've got account required on the requisition item. So this is for requisition, and if I go in and edit this, so again, here is my, um, if I, I was actually using create, I would have to put in the name, the description, um, and then I'm, I'm basically skipping this stuff up here. Um, it will already default to enabled, and then in our documentation, what I have set for, because I know we have this one as one of them, I'm basically taking the information from the documentation, here's the one, copying this, and then pasting it into this rule. So once I'm done, I click on validate first, because if something funky is going on with um, what I entered in here, it's going to tell me. But if it says that the validation was successful, basically then um, I would go in then and try to create a requisition and see if it's going to allow me to post that with a missing account or a missing vendor or whatever my rule is written for. And if that works okay, then I can pass that on to the district and tell them that we have that working for them. So like I said, right now we just have some requisition ones, but you know, obviously we'll keep building them as people create tickets asking for certain things. Um, we can't, you know, we can't guess what people are going to um, want, so we're basically going to build them as we get feedback from everybody. 
So um, for those rules that are um, bundled but may not be mandatory, I could say true here and I could say false here and it will show me those and then I could also say false to say has this already been enabled? And so these are bundled rules that aren't mandatory that haven't been enabled yet. So if there's one of these where um, the district does want this rule to be installed, then basically what I can do then is go in and activate this. So obviously I'm going to pick on one of these here. Error, prevent opening a previously closed posting period. So this isn't mandatory. So if I want this to be mandatory, once a period is closed, um, the district doesn't want somebody to reopen the period, I can enable this. So I'm going to first go in and edit, and I want to make sure that it's been enabled. So I'm going to click on enabled, and I can validate this if I want to. And it says that it looks good, so you can go ahead and save it. One thing to keep in mind is that even though it shows that it's enabled, it isn't activated until I click the activate option. So that's going to go out there and reload the enabled rules to the current rules engine. So the current rules engine isn't reading this yet until I activate this. Once I do, if I try to go into posting periods then and try to open a closed period, I'm going to get an error saying that this period cannot be open based on this rule. So what does uh, bundled mean on the rules here? Um, it means that it came with the software um, is what that means. So these are things that were probably in already in USAS and they came over into um, the redesign. So and I think we have that up here in the definition as to what those mean. Oh, it has it right here. Bundled means it came it came with the USAS R software. And then obviously mandatory means that it cannot be disabled. Okay. Um, Users, we pretty much touched upon this the first day, but it doesn't hurt just to look at it one more time. We did talk about it here while we were going in, adding permissions and, or adding roles and rules, but I just want to sum up a couple things in here. I'm going to pick on that test user. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and edit this. Um, another question that just came through, um, does it activate all rules? It just activates, when you click on that activate option, it's just going out there and finding, you know, you have rules already out there that are in use. It's just going out there and any that you have enabled that haven't been activated, it's just going to activate those. So it's just looking at those enabled rules that haven't been activated yet, and then it'll go out there and activate those. So just talking about the user here, um, again, there is obviously their username is going to pull in from the import, and if you want to add an actual name, title, and an email address, the district can do that. Um, and then the assigned roles, so these are the roles that are assigned, those are getting carried over, so my AP person at the district. Um, has standard access in USAS, then they're going to have the USAS standard role in the redesign. So you can assign more than one role too. So it just doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one relationship. Same thing with filters. Um, you can assign a filter in here. Um, this is the one-to-one. -one. So your filters are coming from the um, account filters option under, underneath utilities. So that's where that's coming from. Um, created date, the data was created. Requisition prefixes, we talked about this too a little bit. Um, get out of here for a sec, I got frozen up here for a little bit. Go back in, there we go. Um, 
So in here, if this specific user is going to be processing requisitions and I only want a test user to use a prefix of test, um, then that's what I'm going to put in here. And if I want them to be able to only see the requisitions that, can, that have the prefix of test, I'm going to restrict that as well. And so I'm going to have this check marked. Um, do I want them to be able to post to negative balances or do I want, to, want them to be warned? Um, by default, it allows it. So you can restrict that by unchecking those. And then after that, I think everything else is more related to their account expiration. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. So when you're actually creating that uh, user, you're basically putting, you know, if it's a new user, obviously, you're going in and creating the username, assigning a role, a filter, if they have a filter, and if they're processing requisitions, um, and then their balance checking. So again, um, we talked about the whole thing with the password expiration. If my password expiration is set up to expire in 90 days, um, once I click on save, it's going to go from today's created date and go 90 days and set a date in here. Obviously, it's going to be enabled by default. And so at this point then, I'm going to go ahead and save this. And let's say this was a new user. After I get done creating this, I'm going to go over to my change password option and I'm going to change the password on this or set a password if it's a new user, obviously. So, um, so I can put in whatever I want here, and if um, I, when I go ahead and give this user their username and password, again, um, if I don't expire the password when I was creating the user account, they're going to have to go in and change the password, knowing, trusting them to go in and change it, or else they're going to use the password that you gave them. So if I don't want that to be the password that they're going to use, I need to make sure when I was underneath user here, that I put in a password expiration date. So if I don't, then when they log in, they can use the password I gave them. If I want to make them change that, then I have to set that password expiration date. And then when they log in, they're probably going to try to use the password you gave them, but they should get a message saying password expired. They have to go down here then underneath change password and change it to a new one. And that way then we don't know what the password is that they're using. It's kind of how we've done things um, in classic. So same type of protocol here. Um, should the change password button be disabled if using Active Directory? I'm not the person to talk about when it comes to Active Directory. I'm assuming, yes, that you don't want that, you, that you do want that disabled because um, they're using the same password for everything, I would think that you definitely, um, go back here. Should the change password be disabled if using Active Directory? How would we disable it? Um, and if you go in and change the password, that I would assume would affect, I don't know what all that affects. Carrie, I'm going to have to look into that. That's a good question. I'm just not knowledgeable with Active Directory because we don't use it here at um, Nawaka. So let me check on that. That's a good question. Anything I can't answer today, guys, I will shoot in an email to all of you guys so you know the answer to it. Let me write these down. Um, there was another comma after that here. Pull that up. 
And if, and if there are people on that have been using Active Directory to your, uh, with your districts, please speak up um, if there's something that you can help with when it comes to these. Um, can more than one user have the same prefix, say for a department? Um, yes, I don't think I specified this, I'm sorry. So in requisitions, um, you can separate the prefixes by a comma. So you definitely can have more than one requisition prefix. Um, should the change password button be disabled if using active, oh, okay. So um, like I said, I'm gonna go ahead and, and find out more from that. Uh, yeah, so yes, definitely. I will go in and check on that and see um, what needs to be done with that. Oh, I got a message here. I think the password uh, config, uh, the last box, if you hover over it, answers that question. So are you saying in, let me go back in here. Underneath the configuration, So in here, if you're putting in a, yeah, so you're saying if you're leaving this as a zero, right, under the password lifetime? I'm not quite sure, but let me check on that to see if this would take care of that. I'm sorry, I wish I would know, I wish I knew more about the whole LDAP thing, but I'll Active Directory, but I'll find out. So, and I will shoot you guys an email once I get the correct information on that. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to show you underneath system that I'm able to show you. Um, I'm going to go into utilities and I want to talk about um, the options that are available in here. There's, there are quite a few um, that we can go over here. And the first one is the account filters. Um, so this is uh, that second screen of USA Security. So the first screen of USA Security in Classic were some of those settings that we saw underneath user. And the second set then is, uh, or the second screen in USA Security is the actual account filter. So in here, um, when I go in, and obviously when everything gets imported in, all of these get imported. So let's talk about what you're seeing in here. So I'm gonna go in and create an account filter and I'm gonna give it a name. So let's say I'm setting up um, account filter access to a building secretary and I only want her to have access to budget accounts for that building, but I wanna exclude salary and benefit accounts on that. So. I'm going to call this high school secretary. And so now I'm going to go ahead and click on the plus sign. And so here it looks very similar to what you guys are used to seeing in USA Security. So you've got your actual account code dimensions and then you have these access levels over here. So when I think about this here, I know that I want to restrict them from 100s and 200s. So those are going to be my first things I'm going to enter in, just like it was in Classic. The more specific things are defined first, and then the more broad things are defined next. So I know that I'm talking just budget accounts, and I know that it's 100, and there are percent signs in here. And then, so I've got my salary here. 
I do not want to grant any type of access to these. So I'm leaving these boxes unchecked. And I'm going to go in and do the same thing for the 200s, leaving them unchecked. And then I'm going to go in and say for the rest, for this building, which let's say it's 001, I want this particular person to be able to read these and process requisitions. That's what the P is for, pre-encumbrance. And so this will then allow the user then, when they're creating requisitions and they're viewing their accounts, they are only going to see any budget account with an OP of 001 that basically has an object code between 400 and 99 or 899 or 999. Any questions about that? I'll go ahead and click on save. So by not check marking, that's going to restrict them. By check marking then, that's the type of access that they're going to have. And just to hover over these, so we've got create, we've got um, read, there we go, update, delete, pre-encumbrance, and the actual, which is your requisitions, and encumbrances, which, is your, which are your purchase orders. So the same type of setup that you guys um, were used to in Classic. And then obviously, um, Michelle, the, yes. It's me again. <laughs> the, um, we we had trouble with that pre encumbrance setting. I wonder if anybody else did after the migration. Like when we went to do the requisition training, um, all of them had that P checked, and they kept getting an error about the pre encumbrance. But we had already turned off the pre encumbrance module. And so we knew that they weren't tracking pre-encumbered amounts, but we kept receiving an error. We had to go in and take that P off of everybody, had to uncheck it before they could create a requisition. Oh, I don't know why you would have to do that. I'd have to look into that. To see, so do you know what the air was that they were getting? Uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't know the specific lingo, but it well, was. Well, I'm going to see if I can recreate this here. Okay. So I will try that, um, Deb, and see what's going on with that. Because I, from what I understand, that um, that should be checked in order for them to do requisitions, but it just makes me wonder now if it's something, if they've got that role, you know, do they need this specified? So I'm going to ask, but I just assume that they did. So I'll look, so once you checked, checked that off, then it was fine, and they didn't have any other problems, and all of their account access was correct when they went to create requisitions, huh? Well, we had other issues, but <laughs> <laughs> they they were eventually able to create requisitions. Um, okay. But we had to uh, turn it to uncheck the P, and uh, the other thing was uh, we had the district had given us some filters, and we applied the filters, uh, like for like you said, just an OPU, right. and they 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 weren't correct. It was like we got it from the the person gave us the payroll, the building numbers instead of the OPs. Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> so uh, it's a really good training, believe me. <laughs> gotcha. So yeah, that would probably be a problem if they were giving you the wrong codes. Um, but yeah, I'll look into that pre-encumbrance thing and see what's going on. So I'll add that to my list of things to get back with you guys on. Okay. Any other questions about account filters? We were having um, a few issues with account filters, but I believe they got resolved on one of these last hot fixes that we had. People were going out there and 
modifying existing account filters and um, things weren't working properly and things like that. So, but I think we got that all cleaned up. Okay. Account change. So this is basically the replacement for the account change um, system in uh, Classic. And so in here, you have the ability to um, collapse accounts, and you have the ability to take an account and, um, and create a, and, and merge it with another account that's brand new. So let me kind of explain that here. Um, so in my example here that I have shown on here, I am trying to merge two existing accounts. And so these, this, you know, these accounts both exist, and I want to take them um, and merge this account into this one. So I clicked on Create, go back to Edit here, and first of all, it's asking me the fiscal year that this is happening for, and it's for, I'm in fiscal year 18, and then the from and to accounts. So it was from this account. So this was my existing account. And again, I can start, type, I believe I can start typing things in or I can go to the drop down um, and enter in the account, my from account. And then this is my existing account that I am chart, that I'm trying to merge that into. And once I click on save then, what happens then is it sits here and then I have to go and check mark this. So I could do a bunch of different ones. I could do another one and let's say I had five different account changes going on. I could check this top box for each one individually. Oh, my whole screen froze up on me again. Let me, sorry about that. I'm having like VM issues, not so much software issues here. All right. Let me go back into account change. And so when I click on apply then, there we go. Or when I check mark this, and then I click on apply, and what it's going to do then is it's going to go out there and apply my changes and actually do the merge uh, of those two. Um, so what happens then is this works, it acts a little bit differently than it did in Classic. So in Classic, when you merge one account into, into another, that old account was removed. You didn't see that account anymore on the system. Not in the redesign. It's going to inactivate that old account. So it's going to show as inactive, but all the transactions tied to that account are going to be um, associated with that new account. So if I go in and pull up that one of those transactions against that account, it's going to reflect the new one. Um, so that's one way of doing an account change. Um, if you are trying, oh, go ahead. Somebody have a question? Yeah. Does that only uh, hit transactions in the current fiscal year, or do you have to tell it what you're doing? <sighs> because that fiscal year is set, you know how when I went into create and it tells me starting fiscal year, I believe that it's only going to start from that fiscal year on. I don't know if it's going to go back and pull all of those tractions, transactions from those prior years and switch that over. Or else because I'm not, I don't, uh, but, Yeah, I don't think we'd want it to. Yeah, it, because... And, oh, go ahead. And will it... it um, will the USPS integration understand what you've done, too? Will it see that? What if pay codes are tied to the older inactivated account? From what I understand, that, um, like, when, when they do that, oh, what's that option they do in payroll? The account sync. It's going to go out there. You know, I think that account sync is run every night. So it, it's mm -hmm. talking to USAS daily, so it should know about these updates that are happening in USAS. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I believe that's what that fiscal year 2018 is for then. It's just going to be focusing on um, those transactions for that year. Now we had some people say, I'm, I'm uh, going in and the, the account that I want this to be um, changed to doesn't exist on the system right now. Maybe, you know, when they created this account, the wrong, um, they used the wrong OPU or something like that. Um, and so in that case, you have to create that new account first before you account change the old with the new. So in my example here, these both existed already, and they both had been used. So if I've got a new account, I first have to go and create that new account and instead of having to go into core and do it from there, we've got the expenditure and revenue buttons in here. So I can click on new expenditure account and I can add the expenditure account in here first and then once I have that account created, then I can use the create option and go in and pull the old and the brand new account that I just created and go ahead and um, proceed with the account change. So that's why these are there. You're probably wondering, what are these for? And that's if the new account you want to account change into doesn't exist on this system yet, you can use those. Uh, the, when you're doing the apply and the apply goes through, the status is going to keep updating. You can click on refresh to keep pushing that status along until it says that it's been completed, uh, but that's what that's for. And so, and we have documented this as well in uh, the user guide and how to use this. I haven't walked a district yet through an account change yet, so, um, but those capabilities are out there. Um, fund change, I'm waiting for somebody to ask me about fund change. It is not um, out there yet to do a fund change, just an account change at this point. Um, let's see here. So if you account change, I assume the old inactivate account will not be reported to EMIS, correct? Correct, because all of those transactions and things are pointing to that new account. You're correct. Okay. AutoRec, we talked about on day one, that's where you're basically doing the one-time setup for the auto reconciliation. So. Those of you that weren't there on day one, this is basically what it looks like. They go in and create the auto rec format for the bank, and then when they go into disbursements, the auto rec option is going to ask for the import file type, and they're going to enter in that import uh, file that they or that format that they created, and that's what's going to be used when they reconcile. Change password is pretty self-explanatory, where they're able to change passwords. File archive and file import. Um, so this is to be used um, right now. It's to be used to take the old monthly CD files from Classic and import them in to the redesign. So we do not have monthly CD available right now in the redesign, believe me. I want it just as much as everybody else does. Um, so that is something they know. I really would like it to be out before fiscal year end, but I, I don't know if it, that's going to happen um, at this point. Um, but um, so right now with districts, when they're closing for the month, they are running their, their reports individually and saving them to a file folder on their computer. So, and that's part of our month-end checklist. It'll also be part of our fiscal year-end checklist as well. But for those districts that, you know, like our Nawaka districts that have um, their old monthly CD stuff, we can take that now instead of them having to go back into monthly CD website to get that information, we can put it out here now. And so these two options here, File import and file archive are involved in that process. The file import is where they're going in and uploading that zip file. So um, uh, we have a question here. Can other staff be logged in and working when you process this? 
I, I believe so, because I know when um, Nawaka was doing theirs, we didn't tell um, the uh, district staff to be out, if that's what you're asking. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is for account change. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they would not be able to, so you should be able to um, go in and there shouldn't be any reason uh, why you, they can't perform account change and other staff still be in processing. So, yes, they should be able to. So, uh, a question regarding the um, monthly CD stuff. Um, is this working? When you're uploading a zip file, how much are you uploading? A full year, a month, et cetera? It's, a, it's uh, depending on your zip, um, you're probably doing a full year. Um, what we do um, when we archive like our NAWAKA data, we pull up a full year, and that's what we load in here. Um, so I believe that it's, I'm not sure if it has to be a full year, I would have to check on that, um, but I believe that's what we've been experiencing so far, is they're taking a full year. Um, it might even be more than that. I'm wondering if they're taking years worth and pulling it up into uh, let me look here. Um, let me see what if we've got some more descriptive documentation on that here. I don't believe we do, but let me check. So I'm going to go to file import. Okay, it does answer it. The file, uh, zip file would typically contain the whole directory structure for all years. So, yeah, because I'm thinking when we did, um, when we did our Nawaka ones, I believe Sarah pulled up everything and pulled it in there. I know it took a while. It took quite some time in order for them to upload the data in there, but they weren't getting an error. So, let me look and see what they did exactly um, in order to get theirs uploaded and see if there was, if they encountered anything. So I know it says it's not available at this time. Um, it, that's out of date, um, so I apologize for that. I think that all got resolved um, on one of our releases or hot fixes that we've got that fixed, so I apologize for that. Um, because it wasn't at, at a certain time, but I think uh, we've updated that now, so that should be working, because I believe we've got at least one of our Nawaka districts um, monthly CD. So I will check on that and make sure, but um, I believe, though, when they uploaded that, it was years' worth of data that they pulled up, and, uh, and they used the file import to upload that zipped file and then once that uploaded successfully, then what happens is you go to the file archive and it lays out the fiscal year, the month, and the name of those files. And then with, a, I believe, a PDF extension that you can pull up then and look at. So I don't know exactly how it looks yet. I haven't gone out there to, to check it out, but that's what it's supposed to do. Um, so I'm going to have to check on the status of Nawakas to see if we did successfully upload those, and if so, how does that look? So I'll, I'll check on that and let you guys know. But that's basically the steps, is to first do the import. Once it's imported successfully, it should show up on the file archive. And then when it comes to implementing monthly CD in the redesign, I'm not sure how that's going to work. I don't know if there's going to be a certain program that's going to, that they will run to execute and get those out there here on this um, grid. I'm not sure how that's going to work, but I know it's something that everyone's been wanting. So, and you know, the prioritization committee, they uh, discussed it as well and they all are adamant that they want that sooner rather than later. So hopefully we'll get that out soon. Um, uh, the mass load, um, 
this is where um, we only have a couple limited options in here right now, and that is being the ability to mass load cash account expenditure and revenue account information. We don't have a way to mass load vendors or anything like that yet. That stuff's not out here yet. Um, so I don't have the, um, all the documentation on all of these yet in order to give you guys full details on how to do these. Um, but from what I understand, I could take the information from like the old, um, what was it? Auto post, I believe. No, not auto post. Um, our old spec files from Classic and use the same CSV formats from there, from USA load, um, from the ACK load, and kind of use the same formats with the field data names, the Excel data field names, and be able, as long as I have those correct headers, we then should be able to take that information and upload, um, you know, cash expenditure and a revenue account data if we need to. Um, I don't think this is anything that all of us would be using right now um, at this point, um, but uh, once we get more information about the proper format, that documentation will be updated. I just don't have a lot out there right now, other than all I know is that these are the importable entities that we can do right now. So when you think about expenditure accounts, if I wanted to go in and inactivate um, a bunch of budget accounts for some reason, I should be able to do that in this option by going in and having the account code dimensions and having the status field and being able to take that and upload it in here and mass and activate accounts. So I should be able to do that in here. Um, the job scheduler. Um, you guys have the ability to allow, um, to create jobs to be run at certain times. Um, I know we have one district that would like um, a specific account run every Monday morning for their districts. I think it's like an outstanding purchase order report or something like that. And so we set up a job and that's done on the reports, on the generate report option, and it's called a cron job. And then what happens then is uh, you can go into this job scheduler and see when that job ran. Um, it's going to store it on here. And we have this also in our documentation. So if I go back up to appendix, I believe I've got it in the appendix one here. And let me go into appendix. Scheduling a report to run via cron job. And so in here, basically, you can go in and it shows you right here um, how to schedule the report. So where that's at, it says you need to go to the generate report window first and there's this job scheduler icon, this guy right here. So when I'm in here and let's say I go in, I'm gonna go to my home screen here and just run a cash summary. And let's say I wanna set this up to run every Monday morning. Um, I'm using this little guy right here. And so when I click on him, it's going to ask me for the job name, the cron expression, and who is to receive this. And so if I go back to the documentation here, it specifies um, basically this is what it looks like. So in my job name, I'm calling it a cash summary report. I want them to be able to, get, you know, to see that as well. And I'm creating a special report just for the cafeteria person. And so my cron expression, um, we have a link here on, there's different free cron expressions out there um, that you can generate a cron expression for. So the one we have right here, this free online one, basically allows me to go in and select the day, the time, you know, the specific, the month or whatever I want, and it will, it will create a cron expression for me that I can basically copy and paste. So with this um, specific guide here, I can go in and create this cron expression, 
and it's telling me that there's no seconds um, uh, detail specified in here, no minutes, but I want it to happen at 7 a.m., as I'm assuming, because I'm assuming it's using military time, um, and the day of the month, um, I don't really have a specific day, I just want it to run on Mondays. So I'm going to jump over to day of the week. So I have that specified. I don't have a specific month. I just want it to run every Monday, and obviously I don't have a specific year. So I'm selecting these in this free cron job uh, website, and then I can take that cron job expression and paste it, because it, it formulates it up here. I can copy this and paste it into my job parameter. And then my send out output to is the email of the intended recipient. And you can put in multiple email messages as well. You're just separating them out by commas. And then it tells me that after I run this, a pop-up message will appear stating that the job has been created. So then you go underneath utilities to the job scheduler and you can see that job listed there. So if you totally messed up and you want to start over, you can click on the X to delete it and go in and run a new one. And so um, you can see here it shows that it, the status is pending. So if I get a failed, if it you know, went through that Monday and, it, and they never, and they called and said we never got the report, um, then I have probably a failed message in here. And I believe then I can edit this and view it to see what happened with that cron job. So this is something that um, I think districts are still, you know, or ITCs are still kind of getting used to. Some people may use cron jobs. Some may use the report link that I'm going to show you guys here in a little bit. Um, and that will allow you to go in and create an actual link of a certain report that the user can save and bookmark it. And then they can click on that link and get a cash summary report whenever they want. So they're not waiting on a report to be sent to them at a specific time. They've got that URL saved and bookmarked where they can go in and generate it when they want to. So that's another possibility. So I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but that's, you know, this, that's where that system, or I'm sorry, that uh, underneath utilities, back there here. That's where these cron jobs are stored underneath the job scheduler. Um, I am getting short on time here because I want to get to reports. We do have a proration utility. I won't go into much here detail. This is something that can be done and used at the end of, or, or like for um, workers comp. Um, I know you can prorate other things as well. Um, but in here, you can specify a certain time period. You can also include a certain account filter if you want to, um, and then a file name, and it will create um, a proration report. Um, I'm just going to go back to the documentation just so you can see what this looks like, cause, because I believe I have this all documented here. So I'll go back up to utilities. Currently put on hold here. And I okay. So under proration utility, so for example, for workers' comp, I can put in the time period here. I can put in the filters. So for workers' comp, I probably have filters for salary accounts and then the file name, and when I click on Create, it's going to pull it up and display all the accounts that it pulled based off of that filter, and then from here, I can enter in a prorated amount, for example, into column B here. And what it's going to do then, it's going to automatically prorate the amounts entered to all of those accounts on the spreadsheet automatically calculating that prorated percentage um, and prorated amount to be charged to each account here. So you'll see the different um, 
the amounts here, the percentages, and the prorated um, amount from there. And this could be basically their work comp amounts here. And so you can't go in then and take this spreadsheet and click on like purchase order to, uh, to create a requisition or purchaser out of it. It's basically at this point, because it really, this prorate utility is kind of still in its infancy, I think that we are going to add more features to this eventually. But you're going to be using the spreadsheet as a template, and then you're going to be using that then and actually manually entering in the record, the PO, for that. Okay. The show profile, we already went through that, shows the user and what type of access that they have. USPS integration, we talked about that yesterday. There really is no reason for them to go in and test the connection for once they import the data um, and they set up um, the modules in order for them to be installed for USAS and payroll on both sides. Um, they're really, uh, in USAS, they really won't be needing to come in here and make any type of setup or changes to this. It should all be connected automatically. And again, this will not show until you install that module. Okay. It's time to talk about reports here. I'm going to wrap this up here in the next half hour. Um, report seems to be the biggest hot topic um, with everybody right now, and I believe um, you know, a lot of districts are nervous about um, the reports and a lot of, you know, rumors are going around that they look way different and stuff like that. And, I, you know, I think, you know, part of our job is to make sure that districts feel comfortable with how the reports look before they actually go in and start using them. And so I know that, you know, we've met with districts who are concerned about the reports. And I think it's those that, you know, are heavy on those PDF files, you know, those that use spreadsheets that have been waiting for, for state software to be able to create spreadsheets out of reports. They don't really seem to have any, any issues with the reports, but those who are heavy, you know, text file users in uh, Classic are, you know, nervous about how these reports are going to appear in PDF in the redesign. So it's just, you know, making sure that you show them those reports that they're comfortable with as well as find out from them what reports they have to have before they, you know, start using the redesign and showing them what they're going to look like um, just so they feel more comfortable with what's available. And from there then, you know, eventually getting them more comfortable creating the reports themselves. I think it might be a little daunting to them right away when they're trying to learn the rest of the system um, and try to learn reports, you know, as well. I think it's always good to, um, you know, get on the system, get them comfortable with things, and then maybe bring them back in later to talk about reports and how to create reports on their own. But I think at the beginning, you guys will probably find yourselves creating reports for them so that they are in place when they are starting. Um, you know, and to be honest with you, I know those users that we trained on Classic for years, you try to get them in to run a BudSum or, you know, a BudLed and have them look at it, and all those sort and subtotal options, they didn't like, they, they really struggled with that stuff as well. So. Um, it's just a matter of getting used to it, you know. So once they get comfortable with it, they'll be able to take off on this themselves. Um, so with that being said, when I go to the report menu here, I have really three different things going on here. I've got the report manager, which are our template reports. So when I click on that, it's going to take us to all the state software template reports, and we have a lot in USAS. Um, there's also the option to create a report on your own from scratch using the custom report creator. So that starts them right off at the object and they're creating the report themselves. Um, they can create custom reports 
from the report manager by using one of the state software template reports, tweaking it, and customizing a report from there. That gives them a lot more information to work with instead of going from scratch using the custom report creator. And then these are currently the canned reports that we have out there. Um, we have an account status report, and we also have a vendor new hire report. So when you think about the new hire, um, the vent hire program in Classic, um, they're reporting their, their vendors, um, independent contractors to the new hire reporting center. Um, this is the alternative to that vent hire program. So I'm going to go ahead and click on report. I'm sorry, report manager. And so you're going to see a lot of reports that, you know, this is my test account. I'm in here creating all kinds of crazy stuff, um, testing stuff out. So I'm just going to filter just by SSDT so you can see the SSDT reports. And in here then are all the different reports that SSDT has created. So obviously we're doing away with the six character <laughs> um, acronym and trying to make more sense of what these report names really are. And so um, we've got the report name. They can also include the description column in here. Um, we have a tags column. So they can go in and they can tag one of their custom reports or an SSDT report and tag it to something that they use um, periodically. Maybe they use this type of report at calendar year end. Well, the 1099 vendor report, I can go in by clicking on this edit <coughs> and all that's going to allow me to edit um, is the, on an SSDT report, is the tag. So I can say, this is a calendar year end report, so I'm going to tag it as that. So when they go in, they can see they're going to keep building and this is going to get very large. They can go in and just go in and filter by that specific tag and just pull up those reports for that month, that quarter, so on and so forth. So um, when you edit um, a custom report that isn't an SSDT report, like this one, when I go to this edit, it not only allows me to edit the tag, it's also going to allow me to edit the actual report name and the description of the report. So with the SSDT template reports, you cannot change the actual report name or description, but you can tag it. Um, but for any reports that you've created, um, you can go in and edit the report name and description if you don't like what you originally set it up for. Okay. So you see, you know, when it comes to these reports that you created, you have access to, to everything. So in an SSDT report, you don't have as much access here. So I want to explain why there would be a difference. Um, these are all reports that this user created, the admin user created. So they should have the ability to go in and make any changes they need to. They should be able to go in and edit it. They should be able to go in and delete that report if they're not using it anymore. They can go in and download the report definition, and they can go in and share this report with other roles. So if I created um, some type of cash summary report for the cafeteria, and I want all the ladies that, you know, in the cafeteria that have access to reports to be able to see that, I can create a role for those people. Um, and then I can share this one report with everybody. So when they log in, they will see that report in their report manager. Um, also, I can bookmark any of these, whether they're um, template, or I'm sorry, whether they're um, defined by the user or their state software report by just bookmarking it by click check marking this. And when I go to the home screen, those are the reports that I'm going to see by default. Um, so if I go in and do an SSDT type report, you'll notice that some of those things are shaded out. So I can go in and open the report definition. So I can do that whether I'm uh, a user that created it or it's an SSDT report. This will allow me to go in and view the information that's on the report. What are the fields on the report? What are any filters that have been set for that report? 
this will allow me to customize it to what I want the report to be like. Um, you notice that I don't have the ability to delete uh, SSDT template report, and I don't have the ability to share that report, but I am able to download the report definition, um, tag it, and obviously generate it. And book, bookmark it as a favorite here. Okay. So let's talk about, I'm going to pick on the cash summary report, and I'm going to click on the generate first just to tell you all the options that are available in here, because we keep adding stuff to this. Um, and so the first thing not too long ago that we added was the save and recall option. So this reminds me of the save sets we had in Classic. Um, so when you went into um, your BudSum report, there was a save recall option down at the bottom, and we could go in, whatever we entered on that report, we could go in and save those, uh, you know, settings and then recall them later. Well, you're doing the same thing in here. So in here I can go in and say, you know what, I, I want to create this um, just for the cafeteria fund. And, you know, you could get pretty specific, you know, in some of these, some, some more of the like transaction-based reports. And I just want active and that's all I want here. So I want to go ahead and save these settings, these query parameters that I have entered. So, and also the format, I still want it to be PDF, it's in landscape, yep, I want all of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here and purposely select the blank space and say cafeteria. Cash report. And then once I tab off of there, it takes me to the save option and I can go in and click on save, and it's going to save that report setting. So now when I click down on my down arrow here, I'm going to have a cafeteria cash report. You'll see a cafeteria is my favorite one to use in this example. I got three of them here. So if I'm like, you know what, I want to get rid of these two because I'm not using them anymore, I can select it and I can delete it. Yep, I don't want lunchroom and I don't want just this misspelled cafeteria one. And obviously I can, you know, come back in here and pull this up and then I can click on generate to generate that report. So those are going to be saved in there. So if they get pretty, pretty uh, detailed on here, they can have a pretty long name of uh, save sets that they've done. Um, the default um, we'll just take them back to the default settings. And then the most recent is the default option that's selected in here. Um, so if I go in and, it, so when I first go into generate um, report, most recent is going to be the default setting in that field. And so if I go in and put in 006, and then I go in and I generate that report, and I come back in later, to create another cash summary later on that day, it's going to retain my most recent settings. So it's going to remember my cash summary report from earlier today and still provide those details. So again, if I want to clear those out, I can go down to these parameters to clear them out, or I can go to default to clear everything out. And, uh, and yeah, that's about it for that. Um, I'm going to talk about this report link option here in a little bit. So that's the thing I was talking about where you could save um, a bookmark a certain link and, and people can use that. Um, but first I want to talk about um, the other report options that we're seeing in here. Um, the different formats. So um, we've got all these different types of formats that are in here. So PDF download is the default setting. We also have CSV and tab delimited. Um, this Excel option um, is probably not used as often as what you might think because it basically is a picture placed in an Excel file. It's not like a true Excel file like the CSV option is. So, you know, you guys play around with it and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about here. But it pulls it in. Well, let me just show you. Go ahead and select this. 
fund here, and I'm going to choose Excel. I'll go ahead and generate this. And so it, you'll see, you see how it looks? It's got like, it's almost got like a picture on top of an Excel document. So if I go in and enable, it's, it's hard to go in and make adjustments and calculations off of this style in Excel. If I used a CSV, you know, these would show better in here, and it wouldn't be quite a picture mode, you know? So you'll see it when you start um, going in and, and creating uh, documents that the CSV option might be a better option than the actual Excel option in here. <coughs> All right. So I'm gonna go back to my cache summary again. And so other ones that are pretty popular, <clears throat> we have an Excel data, that's another one that's used heavily, and the Excel field names. Um, so the Excel field names might be helpful when you're importing some stuff. One example I was talking about was mass load um, and being able to maybe mass load like a status that's inactive. It needs the Excel field names in order to recognize them in the redesign. So that might be something where I'm going to create a budget report of the accounts I want to inactivate using the Excel field names and then go into that report, you know, change the status to inactive because it has the proper headings up top and then upload it into the mass load option. So um, what um, we're going to do is we're going to create a table um, in the documentation with the formats and the formats that you need to use for certain reasons. Um, so that's something that I'm hoping to do sooner rather than later. So these, so you know what formats to use for whatever you're trying to do. So we're going to explain that in a little more detail. Page size, orientation, pretty self-explanatory. We do have a summary report option. And so if I went in here and said, I want all my 200 funds, and I want to see a total of all the funds, not broken down by Fund Special Cost Center, I would click on Summary Report. And what's going to happen is it's going to generate, and all I'm going to see is one row or one line item on the report of all 200 total amounts. Obviously, if I want those separated out to see Fund Special Cost Center, I would uncheck this. And the summary report is only going to be more helpful with PDF, like the CSV option will not summarize that data. That's why, again, we're going to create that table about the different formats uh, because we want to explain that some of these, based on what you select down here, may not work with the different formats. So we're going to try to be more um, detailed about that. Uh, the show report options is something new. So this is like your options page in Classic. So that'll tell me exactly what um, I selected. And so this is something I'm sure um, the districts will like to have so that they can see exactly. And I selected the wrong thing. Let me try that again. I want to use PDF. I think this is something that districts, some districts that really were um, used to running that options page or, you know, they were, you know, wanting to have that kind of audit trail as to when that report was created. It shows me who created it, on what day and time, and the parameters that were selected, the report parameters and my query parameters, which I told them I just went to 200 funds. So, and then obviously then I go to the actual report. So again, if I selected, checkmarked the summary, which I did not, um, if I had checkmarked summary, then I would just, 
E just 200 with total amounts. I would basically see this line, and that's about it. Okay. <clears throat> and so all these query parameters are coming from the configure filters. So when we go to open up a report definition, these will make more sense. So obviously we tried to create as many reports as we could, template reports for the user to use, but they may want to include other parameters. Well, they can open up this report definition, definition using the eyeball icon, and that's the view icon, and they can go in and add or remove some of these query parameters and create their own report. So that's something we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, the one thing I wanted to hone in on is this show report link before we actually open up a report and talk about that. So we have this documented in payroll, but we don't have it documented in USAF yet. And um, they really did a great job of documenting it in payroll and how to use this link. In order for me to use this link, I have to select a report first. So this is a saved report. So that's the stipulation, is that has to be saved first, and then from there, I can click on this report link. And when I do that, it's going to tell me that I can use my browser to copy this web address to execute the report directly or to create a bookmark. And so also, if I'm going to um, copy this, do I want the parameters included in here as well? And so in here, I can go in and then I can right click on this and copy the link address. And then I could go into an open window here and generate this. And it, it, um, when I hit the enter key, it asked me where I wanted to save it and it automatically generated the report for me. Um, one thing that we are changing, and I believe it's supposed to be on the next release, is like I was at a district um, last week and we were trying to come up with um, other options besides cron jobs. Um, and one thing I told them about was being able to bookmark and emailing that bookmark to somebody and then they can, or emailing that URL link, and then they can go in and bookmark that, and they still need a username and password to the system in order to use that bookmark, and then all they would need to do is save that, um, and then go in and generate that whenever they want. Well, it didn't work, and we found a, a problem with that, so, um, you can't share bookmarks. Now, if I created a cast summary for myself, and then I went out there and created a bunch of bookmarks on different reports that I have created, and I went then in and, and uh, um, accessed those bookmarks, I could see the reports just fine. But like I said, if I went and emailed it to somebody else and had them do it, we have a, a bug with that right now. So we're getting that fixed so that they can share those. Um, and so you can, you know, and so and when you think about that, uh, HTML page can be created with different bookmarks for different people. Um, so a district could really even customize their own web page, kind of like the old FISC web stuff. Um, and then go in and, and put in those bookmarks for those people, and then you know those people could go to that same, everyone go to the same web page with their specific area, click on that, and get their report. So, and it's, it's automatic. It goes right out there to the system, to the live system, and pulls up that information. So what but, um, Michelle, creating the, the web page with those links as we would have done with the FISC web reports, would, is that still just like sharing the link? Is that working or not working? Would that work or not? Um, no, not yet until that gets fixed. So because you really are still, even though you're creating that web page, 
it's almost like you're still sharing it. So until that gets resolved because of the owner of that report, it's not going to work until that gets fixed. So like I said, that that's a, uh, I think that's supposed to go out on the next release. So it's something that, you know, they're, they're not um, uh, pushing back. So because they know how important this link feature is and how useful it could be. So it should be out there sooner rather than later. So um, one thing I wanted to tell you guys as well in this documentation, um, and this is in the payroll manual, and it's under the home page. Um, it talks about this download report option with this report link. And um, they've done a really good job um, with this documentation. I'm basically going to steal it and put it in the UTAS documentation. Um, but it talks about how to go in and use these links. So it goes step by step on they were doing a birthday report and how to first, you know, create a, a save set report and then using the link, doing the um, uh, the actual, creating the actual um, link for um, a web address. And then the next thing that they went into was creating an Excel spreadsheet using this as a web query. And so what they're doing here is again, here's an example, outstanding checks, and they've gone in and right clicked uh, you know, after they clicked on the link icon and they right clicked on the link address and then in Excel, so this is kind of like Safari type of things that we can do here. So they can go up then in Excel and they're going to go to the data tab and choose from web and paste that URL address in there. Once that's pasted in there, so they're taking this and pasting it in this web query, clicking on go, and then it's going to go in and they're going to, it's going to prompt them for their username and password, and then it's going to um, pull up the information from here, and then they're basically going to select all of that and import it into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so you can see here where it's pasted in there. And then they would just save that report to be used again. So they're saving that out there as an Excel spreadsheet. And then when they're ready to go and call that back up again to update your spreadsheet with new data, you're going to open that spreadsheet in Excel and click on that data tab and there's a refresh all button. And then they're basically then going to see their new data. So if I were to go out there and create a cash summary report, and I want to pull it into, you know, and probably not the best example, I pull it into Excel, and, you know, then let's say later on today another cash account was created. Well, as long as they have this spreadsheet saved in Excel, when they go back in, to access this again, they're just going to click on refresh and they're going to see the most up-to-date data. So this is kind of what they're trying to do with the whole Excel database. And I see it probably used more with payroll than USAS, but I'm not so sure. You know, now that we've got these options in USAS, maybe we can open our minds a little bit more to doing, doing these same things in USAS. But when you think about all those different um, ex, um, uh, options that were available in Safari and getting those specific uh, queries um, that they wanted to use and pull it into Excel easily, This they don't have to go into USPSR to do this. Somebody's given them the actual link and then they can use Excel to pull their information in without ever having to go into USPSR. So we're planning on doing a specific um, webinar for this after fiscal year ends over, um, probably, in, uh, probably in June. Um, 
so I hate to really do it in July because it's going to get so busy. Um, we'll probably do a webinar, a Friday webinar, just talking about this report link and all the possibilities that can be done with this. So uh, we will be posting that out there in the Friday webinar. So that's one of our first ones that we want to tackle here at the beginning of this fiscal year. So I'm just kind of giving you just a real brief overview of this, but it's something definitely that I think could be used in lieu of FiscWeb, in lieu of cron jobs, and in lieu of um, Safari. So just to you know keep that in the back of your mind that this is a, a big possibility that can be used. Okay. I want to go right to the report creator and that's how we're going to wrap things up today. Um, so when I go in to generate a report, I'm going to again pick on um, the cash summary here and I'm just going to open this report definition. Oh, I got some, love it, this is awesome, some good uh, chat messages here from people. So it is, it's going to be really nice once we get a better handle on it and you guys can use it. Um, so I opened up this report definition and so the first thing you're going to see are all the fields that are going to be on that cash summary report. They are coming over from the properties. Um, so those are already the default ones. Now this doesn't have to be the end all or be all of their cash summary. If there are certain things in here that they do not want, they can go in and get rid of those specific fields. So if I don't want, oh, I'm just gonna pick on Months to date received, I'm going to delete that, and months to date expended, I can get rid of those. And then um, what you're going to see are the different sort options. So it's sorting by full account code, and this is the cash account. Now I can hover over these different properties, and it will tell me where it's coming from, from this properties um, column here. So full account code, obviously, is just the full account code and that's coming from, I'm sorry, right down here, the full account code. So description is just that, description is coming from here. Now if some of these are coming from within one of these arrow drop downs, um, so let's say I go in here and I go to code and I do fund and I add this. I'm just going to double click and it's going to add it to the bottom. When I hover over that, you're going to see code and then you're going to see fund. So that tells me I first have to go to code and then down to fund. That's where that came from. Um, and so with, um, with this, you also have sort options and you have control breaks. Those are your subtotals. You have your different functions, so for amounts, if you want to sum them. And then we have this extended properties field. Um, and so this has been created to give you more options for each field, um, formatting options and things like that. Um, so for like some of our reports, like our budget summary report, it is first sorted and subtotaled by fund special cost center, and then within that, by all the budget accounts within there. So, I don't want the fund special cost center showing two, step, two different columns on all my pages of my budget summary. I just want it to be at a control break. So with that, I'm going to suppress that one. So you'll see that when you're looking at like the budget summary that some of these have been suppressed because I want to exclude the column from the detail line. So instead, I want to use a control break field to prevent values from printing on every line. So for that fund special cost center, I'm going to control break on that. I don't want that field to show up on every line of my report, so I'm going to suppress it. Um, we got already talked about the sort and the priority and order. We also have support or suppress repeating. If the same value appears on consecutive detail lines, suppress the whole thing. So you don't see those particular fields on the report. Control break, like we said, is like a subtotal and page break. And then we have these functions here. So that's 
this right here. So some of these repeat what's on the grid. You'll see again in here. Alignment. Column title. If I don't like full account code, I want it to be cash account. That's what's going to show in the title of that column. And then I also have the ability to take some of these and pull them into a header or a footer instead of an actual column on the report. Um, and so we're planning on doing another report um, webinar. We've been doing one about every, I don't know, four to five months. And so we're planning on doing another one probably um, more later this summer. Um, and we'll talk about all of these options. That way, for those of you that, you know, this next wave is your first wave on, um, get you comfortable in here, and then we'll show you some of these advanced features. Also, the width. By default, these all have like a, a specific width, um, but if you want that to be larger, you can go in and say, you know, I'd rather this be um, 12 characters. And I, I just have to be honest with you, you're going to play around with it. So you're going to tweak this by um, increasing this more. That's going to decrease the columns for the other fields on your report. So you just have to keep that in mind. The configure filters, this is where your parameters are at. So this is where, this is how they get created. So you can do a hard entered parameter um, or you can go in and enter an actual parameter value. So full account code, I want the program to prompt me to put one in. So I'm going to put in a filter value and these parameters, I tell you what, we have these out there with examples for every different kind of operation. Let me show you where that's at. And hopefully that will help you guys. So I'm going to go to reports and USAS. And I'm going to go to Report Manager. In fact, I'm going to go to Custom Report Creator. I'm sorry. And we've got um, the options down here. Chuck just talks about how to create a report. It does go through all of these options we just talked about. But down here, under Configure Filters, um, using parameters and template reports, we have an example here. And we also have how you select those parameters and a table down here of the different operations, these right here, what they mean and how you use them. So for example, the equals one, if you want to enter a specific filter value, meaning that you're hard coding something in, my filter equals high school band. So that's an account filter. When you hard code one in it and not put in an actual parameter value, that is not a parameter that is going to show when you generate the report, okay? If you go in and actually enter in a parameter value like parameter filter name, then this is what you're going to see under the query parameters when you generate the report. It's going to show filter name and allow you to put in a name. So when you're actually hard coding one in that I just want it to be high school band, you're not going to get this. It's just going to look a high school band. But if you're actually entering a filter, a, you know, an actual parameter, then it's going to allow the user, end user, to enter something in. So we went in and tried to add as many as we could with the different type of operations. So one of, what does that mean? So you're able to enter multiple values with commas, um, excluding, begins with, uh, which is the like option. So all object codes starting with a one, then you would use like. If you're wanting to have separate values, you're going to use one of. So this goes into great detail about all of these and then what it's going to look like under the query parameters. So I would go to here before you really start just to get a better feeling as to how to use or create reports. And by all means, start with a template report. Don't start from scratch. Go to a template 
report first and see what they have. What you'll find yourself doing is a lot of copy and pasting it to other reports. Um, we also have this option here that expands um, the actual filter information. So if you look at this, Look at this line here, full account code one of, and this parameter, that's this right here. Full account code one of parameter, and then an example here. And I can basically copy that now and paste it into another report definition if I wanted to. So you'll find yourself doing that a lot. And so these are all the parameters that I currently have set up for the cash summary. And so when I click on generate report, I'm going to see parameters for each one of these. And here they are. So like I said, if let's say for this fund special cost center one, if I went back to configure filters and I said full account code equals six and I hard-coded something in here, and then I go to Generate Report, you'll notice that parameter is no longer there because I hard-coded it instead of giving it a parameter value. So that's no longer there. So I can just go back then and change that back. Okay. I know it's four o'clock, and I know you guys are probably crossing your eyes and in, a, in a daze. I know that's a lot of information, um, but um, it gives you at least a, an overall view of what the report manager does and the capabilities. I would just recommend you know, going into the documentation and getting comfortable with it and playing with it. You know, go in here and start with the template reports and start tweaking them and getting comfortable with it. That's the best way to learn. And you know, you know, you get a question from one of your districts, I want this type of report. Okay, this sounds similar to um, a cash summary report. So I'm going to go ahead and use this cash summary report and go from there. So that's what the template reports are there to kind of help you out in order for you to customize reports for your district. The reports working group, I'm telling you, we are starting on getting these report definitions out there in order to share them with everybody. So what's happening is when a report definition is created, so I created this custom report, I can take this and I can download the report definition. So let me pick on that cash summary here. I can download the report definition and you'll notice that it saves it as an RPD JSON file. When I save that then, what the uh, reports working group is doing is they're creating all these report definitions, we're testing them out, making sure everything works the way it's supposed to, and then we are going to publish these report definitions onto a public page and we're separating them out by different um, areas. So for example, and I have that real quick, Show you guys this. Um, now, like I said, this isn't available to everybody yet, um, but what we're going to have is you guys are going to see these links here where you can go in to, like, say, the USSR ones, and there are going to be a bunch of RPD JSON files based on the different types of. Uh, reports, so any account-based reports, we're going to have that downloadable file, an actual PDF example for them to look at, and an actual description of what that report does. And so everyone will be able to click on this link, download the RPD JSON file, and then what happens is when you go in, get back to my instance, you'll be able to take that or your end user will be able to take that then and underneath the report manager, there's an import report option where they're able to go in and enter in that file name, click on open, and they will be able, so I can take this cash summary report, click on open, and it will import the file in. And then they can go in and 
create the name and whatever they want for it and click on save. And now they have that report definition and can run it or customize it or do whatever they want with it. So hopefully here within the next month, we'll have quite a few on that public page for everybody. Um, we were getting a lot of um, feedback from some of the ITCs that have been on the redesign, uh, giving us access to the reports that they've been um, work using for their um, districts. And so excited to see just how many we're going to have here, because I think it's going to pile up pretty quick. All right, any other questions? If you guys are still there. <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank everybody. Um, I really appreciate everyone listening in these last three days. And again, I will, these are all being recorded, so I will go ahead and post all of this out there to the website. Um, feel free, please, to email me if you have any questions regarding the recordings or anything that I talked about. I have my homework here, too, about the things that we discussed today. So once I get more information, um, I will send an email to all you guys, so let's give you guys a status update. So thanks, everybody, and um, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.